visual editor at the New York Times, where she brings complex stories to life through visual wit and experimental interactions. Her impressive career to date spans five years as deputy creative director at Bloomberg Businessweek, where she oversaw no fewer than 200 issues and teaching stints at Parsons in New York. Now tonight, she's joining us to share some insights into her own creative process and to explain how she and her team at the New York Times deliver razor sharp visuals day after day, week after week. Um, so Tracy, please turn on your audio uh, and video so we can actually say hello. Hi there. Hi everybody. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks so much for joining us. So well, so soon to the election as well. I'm sure the, the mood at the New York Times is, is pretty frenetic, right? <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. We're, we're being kept busy. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it to you now and um, you can start your presentation and, and share your screen. Um, All right. to everyone else, if you have any questions, if any questions pop up as Tracy's speaking, um, please just pop it in the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to get around to them at the end. Over to you. Cool. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really humbled and excited to be here to walk you through some of the work that I make at the Times. Um, I joined the company about three years ago. My home base is the Styles Desk. My main area of focus is visual ideas presented on the web. I publish a whole range of things. Sometimes they can be small and fluffy, like writing dumb jQuery for a dog you can pet with your cursor, for example. Um, this published on the day of the American midterms elections in 2018, when we were all very tuned in online and maybe we all could have used a bit of emotional support. Or it can be not fluffy, like this piece about protest memetics. Um, we started seeing echoes of the Hong Kong protests a year later in the BLM protests in America, and we asked why. And the answer was memes. So for me, part of my job is looking at how we as a society are using images and sharing them, and what can that tell us about how we're living now. Um, and also part of my work on Styles is developing our big story packages, like this essay collection about how Gen Xers are middle-aged now. Um, when it published, it created a big trending topic of conversation online. And part of the reason why is that I think like it had a very striking visual language. Um, this took about two to three months to make of planning, research, and design. Um, but you know, like other pieces uh, take only two to three days to make, and it's just as impactful. Um, I wrote and illustrated this piece in March Using simple graphics, we taught millions of people how to sew a fabric face mask. It gave readers a sense that they could do something to help themselves, to help others, when you know guidelines and leadership was really unclear. Um, it remains among the top reads of the year for the New York Times. Um, before publishing stuff online, my work experience was in print production. Um, I had cut my teeth making a mag called Bloomberg Business Week for about five years. It was the early 20 teens, biggest bull market ever, startups everywhere, VC money hadn't swallowed America whole yet. We had a lot of fun with typographical and visual experimentation and sometimes taking tiny jabs at the rich, the powerful. And within publishing, it was like the era of special issues, like we made so many of them. And it was really making all of these special issues that I learned what an editorial package was and that there was like a scale of quality. There's on the one hand, a sort of editorial packaging that is what an old boss used to deride as embroidery, a sort of decoration around incohesive things, giving them a brand and shoving them together rather forcefully. And then there's a slightly better form where you're making people feel something at least, right? Like feel emotions, maybe experience humor even. And then finally, there's this kind of editorial packaging that's like held together through a cohesion of thought and tone and argument. You know, in my industry, people are always going on about visual storytelling. It's sort of lost meaning, like a buzzword. Um, this top part is at least how I define it. And for me, a memorable experience in working on something like that was the 2012 Business Week election issue. The whole issue posed a single question, did Obama do a good job or not in his first term? And the whole magazine was structured to answer that one question and every page of the magazine answered to that one question, that one thesis visually. It was like a visual report card for incumbent Obama. And we used images and graphics to present facts to help people decode and understand the world around them. That is totally different than making decorations for a long piece of text. 
you know, this whole thinking about editorial packages is very applicable to what I do now. A lot of times when we make publish big packages of essays online, I keep that little triangle in mind. So at least know that I might be guilty of embroidering where I'm like graphic designing really hard around a lackluster thesis maybe. You know, I'm not gonna knock on that too hard because like I think with some powerful looking graphics, you're still bringing a lot of value to readers. That value might not be like information, but it's making a reader feel like they're part of something larger, more powerful than themselves. Like a celebration of Juneteenth, the Emancipation Day in America, and an especially difficult year. Um, so I think it's good to know where that top benchmark is, knowing that not everything you make every day will be groundbreaking visual storytelling, because that's no way to live. <laughs> like sometimes you're putting a dang poster at the top of an article. And I want to talk a little bit about this article toppers, because though this is not groundbreaking visually led storytelling, these like quick lower stakes online cover moments are highly visible surface of my creative output. Um, this is an illustration for of Sober Bros binging seltzer for an article we published in 2019 about sobriety as a trend now. Um, and judging from the metadata, I made this illustration within three hours with lunch in between. I made one option, showed it to my boss, Corey, and he was like, lol, I love it. And we shoved it online, we pupped it. This is a complete departure from my experience in print production. And I was reminded of this difference recently when creative director Gail asked me to sketch for a potential NYT mag cover story about how Trump and Republicans are peddling this false narrative around voter fraud. I wanted to talk about the process of getting to here because I went through back through all the metadata and it looks like it took something like give or take 44 hours to make with a little over 100 iterations. You know, a million versioning or die is a workflow that I'm very familiar with having worked in print for so long. And usually starts off with something like this. You research, you gather your raw material. In this case, it was Trump's tweets and it's clear from doing just a tiny bit of research that he's been peddling this false narrative for years. And you just sort of like quickly throw something visual together. You're like, okay, yeah, this is gonna work. But you set it down, you go 180, you try something else. Maybe you do some other kind of research. I did some photo research. You know that playground rule where that kid who accuses someone else of doing something wrong is probably the kid who did it. I was trying to see if there was a magical visual or layout that could get at that a bit. And, and then I was in my head, I was like a dirty card trick metaphor genius. And then you try it out and you're like, oh my God, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And then, you know, like there, I was like, is there a way to combine tweets with an image to imply an action, like stuffing out? Is it stuffing out like disenfranchised voters or their concept of democracy? And then I was like, is it not the tweets because it's mixing too many visual metaphors and something else, another symbol that's sort of intervening? Gail suggested maybe a word or phrase could help convey that meaning better. And then I was like, wait, maybe we should try to focus on a specter of voter fraud, or should we hone in on the fact that Trump's basically got the entire federal government carrying this massive campaign of disenfranchisement? Or is it about the kind of like reality distortion field that Trump is exerting? Gail also wanted to see some ideas involving the ballot. Meanwhile, while all those other ideas are brewing, back at your strongest idea, you're having a party trying on different styles of hats. And then the editor was like, yo, I'm like, and sure, are we giving too much real estate to Trump's tweets on the cover? Should we try making the headline bigger? So I'm like, embiggening the font. And so finally we're like, all right, all right, all right, let's go back to something like this. I put it in the center, I wanna see it pop. And then is the master getting too lost? Yay, but wait, you're not done yet. We've decided to carry the conceit to the feature opener. Can you like gather more tweets? Let's try some options. Yay, oh my God, you're not done yet. Like, can we like turn this into an interactive? So online, this piece sort of like sits on top of an article. You scroll and it triggers an animation. Like the Trump's tweets are like assaulting you and like you try to like swat them away, but they respawn. And in this way, you can sort of also like read that some of these are kind of like just total lies and so it's slightly deranged. Um, and like, so a lot of readers experience this writing on the web, right? The way that they experience a lot of article toppers on the web, you scroll and you see some text after the cover. And I'm not here to pass a judgment, like saying one way of doing things is right and the other crappy and wrong, but one took 44 hours and the other took three. Just from like a pure math standpoint, where does the other 41 and a half hour go? Well, it goes to 13 other article covers. Um, this piece is about Silicon Valley bros being obsessed with stoicism. And this is about how the California raisin industry is like very like mafioso, very like full of death threats and very godfather. 
I want to say that there's something very freeing in creating something that's a little less kind of light labored over. Um, for the most part, that has been my experience in digital publishing. You publish way more faster. Sometimes you get to have fun with it. Um, this is one of my faves. Apparently, after talking to rat professors, Katie Weaver finds out that rats love making nests out of your car's engine because the wires remind them of tree roots, their ancestral home. Um, it also leaves me time to make a painting of this iconic Walmart worker who bravely stood up against an insane Nevermaster. Um, it leaves me time to make fan art of Elon Musk, Grimes, and their baby ex. Elon Musk refused to be photographed for his interview, and I was like, hey, time for me to log on. Um, and of course, it leaves me time for like ultra ambitious projects that you can only do online because it engage it engages viewers in like with literal interactivity, like this taxonomy of the new celebrity where we had NY Times writers identify the new form of celebrity now. Like it's no longer Hollywood A-list, B-list, C-listers, but influencers, Twitch superstar, TikTok witches. Um, we then gave New York Times readers seven days to vote on which category of fame they think is most relevant now by upvoting and downvoting. After seven days, we revealed um, who the winners were. Were. I worked on this with a colleague, Rebecca Lieberman, who was amazing. Um, and like, what was amazing about this project was that when it launched, we just saw a torrent of people downvoting on everything. Like this, like, I think like we had 1.7 votes, 1.7 million votes in total of people either upvoting and downvoting and 1.2 million of them <laughs> were downvotes. The people seem really depressed and want to hate on things and we provided valuable service by giving them a platform to do this other than Twitter. Um, and now I will finally walk you through the New York Times secret to coding a wonderful online interactive. There's a magical Google. Oh, I, I'm just informed that I'm just out of time. Seems like it's nice that has got to invite me back for another talk. <laughs> That's it. Thanks very much, Tracy. We could, we could have gone, gone and seen that, but um, that's no problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for that. That was, that was absolutely amazing. Um, really, really interesting. I feel like Gail Bickler as well is going to come up a bit later in Sophie's talk as well. So she's getting two, awesome. two name checks there. Yes, um, for sure. Before you go, we've just had a couple of questions submitted by our, our audience. Um, and they're, they're super interesting ones that you kind of touched on, but it'd be great to go into a bit more depth. Um, so one is, how was the shift from print to digital? Did you encounter any hurdles? And a kind of second question on that one, what's the most valuable skill that you were able to transfer from one to the other? Um, yeah, I think for the first question, I think I'm still going through all the hurdles. Of course, there's like a huge technical gap um, between kind of like learning basic coding, basic kind of like framework of kind of putting stuff on online. And I think um, my team has been really helpful. I mean, the technological team at the times is just like fast and like um, there's always someone who's an expert in something and like I'm really able to draw on that. So like, you know, you still have to like learn new skills but there's always people who are patient enough to walk it through. And I also took night school and front end development um, while I was still at Bloomberg. So I think I sort of like prepared myself for this shift. Um, and then the second question, sorry, there's like window washers right outside here. The second window, question. Window washers right outside. Yeah, could you remind me about that uh, second question? Yeah, I guess uh, what's the most valuable skill that you've been able to kind of transfer from one to the other? Yeah, I think it would be kind of um, just, at a, you know, having a brain for, uh, you know, what a story is. I think like ultimately you're still presenting stories, you're still it's still a narrative form so you kind of like you're empathetic to like how a reader might come to this I think like you know empathy is something that I'm still developing and definitely is a skill and muscle that you learn so fantastic um last question is uh, what does your day-to-day -day look like are you usually working on those kind of quick breaking news stories or do you how often are you working on those longer term packages that you kind of mentioned um, I sort of always have a longer term packages on the background and maybe it's like one week before launch, I'm only focused on that. But, uh, you know, some, sometimes with masks, with Corona, like we wanted to put out service that will help people. So sometimes depending on the news, I, I'm able to switch over um, for some of those shorter term projects. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks so much, Tracy. We really appreciate you joining thanks us this evening and also yeah. to yeah, talking through the, the window washers. Very, very impressive. <laughs> um, 
you can now turn up your audio and video and um, yeah thanks so much for that <laughs>